All right, this is lesson number 17 in uh, the book of John, Jesus the God-man. Open your Bibles to John chapter eight. Now in our last lesson we saw Jesus among the people at the temple during the Feast of Booths. And during His time in the temple He teaches people and is consequently charged by them for various failings. So we'll do a little review real quick here. So what do the people say to Him when He's in Jerusalem? They say first of all they charge Him with being uh, incompetent. Um, uh, they also charge Him with being uh, demon possessed. Also, Jesus responds by declaring their ignorance and His response to them, you know, it creates a division between them, uh, the leaders and the citizens and the people. So remember I told you, the book of John is just a series of dialogues between Jesus and different, and different people, and that's what we studied last time. In the end, Jesus makes a final plea to them to believe in Him, and chapter seven finishes with people, as we have seen in the past, reacting to His appearance in Jerusalem in a variety of ways. For example, the crowd, well the crowd is divided. Some believe and some disbelieve. Um, the temple guards, the temple guards we find out uh, who are sent to arrest Him, they're dazzled by His teaching and they can't find an opportunity to, um, to seize Him. And then of course the Bible talks about the Pharisees and the leaders, they just dismiss the guards and the crowds as ignorant and they begin to plot against him. So we read in chapter seven that, oh, oh the plot is afoot. Now, now it's serious. Now they are out to get him. And we, you know, it's, it's declared. You know, the, the war is declared. No, no longer you know, just trying to subvert him and trying to you know, kind of block his teaching. Now they're, they're really going to go after him. And so chapter seven ends and brings us to the next scene. Remember I tell you, it's just a series of scenes, series of dialogues. Next scene where Jesus is going to return to the temple the following day and this time He's going to face the Pharisees once again. So this time it's Jesus and uh, the Pharisees. So let's read verse one. It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And just a geographical note, uh, John says that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, uh, which is a, is a hillside uh, connected to the city uh, itself. Um, the Garden of Gethsemane is on one hillside and then you go down the Mount of Olives and you go up again and Jerusalem is on the other and you can see Jerusalem from the Mount, um, not from the Mount of Olives, but from the, the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a way station, a resting place. Many times uh, pilgrims uh, who were going to uh, Jerusalem would stop there and rest before they would do the final mile down the valley, up the valley, uh, into the uh, holy city. So uh, Jesus went often to be alone and pray there and He did so on this occasion. Um, verse 2 says, uh, early in the morning He came again into the temple and all the people were coming to Him and He sat down and began to teach them. So He starts again to teach the people who were in and around the temple and He's doing this, He's in the middle of doing this when He's interrupted by the scribes and the Pharisees. So let's pick it up in verse three. It says, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, um, in the law rather, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you then say? They were saying this, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the ground. Now the key here to verse six, uh, is verse six rather, where John says they were doing this in order to test him so that they might have a way uh, to accuse him and then to condemn him. So um, the, uh, the test, if you wish, the trap, was that um, if he said to them, well, let her go, well then they would accuse him of being soft on adultery and thus not in compliance with the law of Moses. On the other hand, if he said, yes, let's stone her according to the law of Moses, well then they would accuse him of disobeying Roman law because Jews had no right, they didn't have a right to execute someone, they had no right to, uh, uh, to, the ca to capital punishment. That had to go through um, the governor at that time. Of course, even the finding of the woman is questionable. It seems that even she was set up in order to be caught. 
and, and, and create this particular opportunity to try to try. So it was a setup. It was simply a setup to try to trap him in his words. So we keep reading verse seven. Uh, goes on to say, but when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Can you see the, uh, the imagery there? You know, they're in the center, he's teaching, they bring the woman, people are coming in and they're looking what's going to happen and then all of a sudden everybody just disappears and he's left alone with the woman. I mean, it's like a movie. You know, well, well, it'd be great to shoot that scene. So now he's alone with her. Now, we don't know what Jesus wrote on the ground. There's all kinds of speculation. Uh, it's a mystery. I'm not even going to speculate. No, no one knows what he wrote on the ground. Um, however, we do know where he is quoting from when he says, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. That we do know. That comes from Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse seven. Now, to understand what he's saying to them, you've got to understand Deuteronomy 17. In this passage, Moses was giving the instructions as to how a stoning for such a sin should be carried out. The idea was that the witnesses to the adultery were to be the ones to cast the stones in the punishment, and then after they had thrown their stones, the people were to cast the stones in order to finish the job. So the witnesses, the eyewitnesses, they had to begin the stoning. The rest of the, so it wouldn't be just a mob. Okay, that's, that, that was the idea. So Jesus is referring them to this command in the law of Moses, but he adds to the idea that the first one to cast a stone should not only be a witness, but should be someone who has not sinned themselves. So once he has said this, he ignores them and he allows them to kind of mull this over for a while, you know, let chew on that for a while. So if they, you know, they're the ones now in a catch-22. They were trying to put him in the box, but now he's put them in the box. And here's their catch-22. If they throw the stone, they acknowledge that they're hypocrites. And also they break Roman law. If they don't throw a stone, they acknowledge that they're sinners. That's your choice, hypocrite or sinner. Break the law or acknowledge your, your sins. For them, it is the acknowledgement of sin which is the lesser evil. You know, better to be recognized as a sinner and not a hypocrite and certainly not breaking Roman law. So in his dialogue with the woman, Jesus shows an alternative way of dealing uh, with, uh, with sinners. Uh, in verses uh, uh, 10 and 11. Uh, he offers forgiveness rather than condemnation and punishment. So let's see if I've got 10 and 11 here. Yeah, it says, uh, straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, from now on, sin no more. So there's the alternative way of dealing with sinners. He offers forgiveness rather than you know, straight condemnation and punishment. One condemned and punished for any infraction, the law. Any infraction, you were condemned and you were punished. The other offered forgiveness and restoration for those who acknowledged, for those who acknowledged their wrong. Now, in telling the woman that he didn't condemn her and that she could go but not sin anymore, Jesus was showing you know, that balance between grace and the acknowledge of sin and, you know, it's not a free ride. He didn't say to her, oh, you didn't do anything wrong, just go ahead, you know, live your life, do whatever. He didn't say that. He said, don't sin anymore, which acknowledges that what you did was wrong, it's a sin. And I don't condemn you, I, I have the right to condemn you, and I have the right, who, because of who I am, I, I, can, I have a right to condemn you and punish you but I, I, I'm holding back that right. Instead, I'm offering you forgiveness. And if you accept that forgiveness from me, then go and don't sin. Don't sin anymore. So yes, he had forgiven, you, uh, forgiven her, and yes, he didn't condemn her, but this is not because he didn't see any sin. He offered forgiveness with the condition that she repents. 
Now, do we know, wouldn't it be nice if there was like a little you know, epilogue, the woman didn't sin anymore, she became a follower, you know, and so we don't have that. We don't know. We don't know what she did, we don't know how she acted. We can only speculate that her contact with Jesus and His gracious conduct towards her motivated her to continue to strive to sin no more. Okay, so now uh, the Pharisees, Jesus and the Pharisees, remember, at the beginning he's teaching the crowd and then they come in and you know, with the setup, they, inter they, they interrupt his teaching. He deals with that, the crowd dissipates, now he's left with just him and the Pharisees and so we, we now have another, uh, another dialogue. Verse 12, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, remember when he says to them, now he's talking to the Pharisees. So he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So once again, Jesus invites people to believe in Him. Now, listen, a person would normally say, I provide light for those who are in darkness. You know, follow me, I'll, I'll show you the light. That, that would be a normal way of saying that. But he doesn't say that. He says, I am the light. And not just part of the light, but the whole of the light that shines only in some part of the darkness, but that illuminates all of the, I'm not a flashlight that gives you a beam of light. I am the light, and where I am, by implication, there is no darkness whatsoever, because I, I dissipate the darkness, I chase it, I chase it away. Now, you also see in this verse that he equates light with life. In other words, if a person has light, that same person has life. Of course, the light that he's talking about is truth. The understanding that one has when that person knows God. Some say, well, how do you find truth? If you know God, you will know what the truth is. His point, of course, if you know the truth, then you have not just ordinary human life, but you have spiritual life, which in essence is eternal life. If you have spiritual life, if you have the truth, then what you have is the knowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. And if you have that knowledge and believe that knowledge, then you not only have light, but you have eternal life, because that's what that knowledge brings you to. It brings you to eternal life. So of course, here Jesus, once again, what's He doing? He's declaring His divinity, His association with God. He's declaring His supernaturalness to these people. Notice the cycle is beginning once again. He's declaring His divine nature to those who would hear Him. So verse 13 says, So the Pharisees said to Him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. So we know He's talking to the Pharisees because they're the ones who are answering Him. He says, I'm the light. And they're saying, oh, you're just talking about yourself. You're just making a testimony. They dismiss what he says and make no comment on what he said. They're more interested in discrediting him than understanding what he's actually said. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that a human tendency when we're in a debate, in an argument with somebody? You, you want to say, hey, hey, you know, respond to what I just said. Instead, you know, sometimes when you're in an argument with somebody, they revert to personal attacks instead of dealing with the issue you're talking about. It's exactly what they've done. They're not dealing with what he's said, they, they simply go around that and tell him, oh, you're a fake, you're just, you're just talking about yourself. They accuse him of making a witness or bragging about himself and claim that if he's doing this, it compromises what he says about himself. In other words, if you're bragging about yourself, then what you say is not true. Remember, that's their goal. They just want to discredit him. So we go to verse 14. It says, Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, but I am not judging anyone. Uh, but even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I and the Father who sent me, even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies um, uh, testifies about me. Okay, long passage. Uh, Jesus is answering from the perspective of His divine nature. That's the, if you understand that idea, then you get this passage. You know, we, the, the series is called Jesus the God-Man. Sometimes He's talking as 
a man and how a man feels about things. Sometimes he's talking from a divine source. His divine nature is speaking. Right here, he's not talking, no man could say what he just said. This is Jesus, the Son of God, speaking to them. He tells them that even though he makes a statement about himself, that statement is nevertheless true because of certain reasons. First of all, he has complete knowledge about his entire past and his entire future, and they don't. Why? Because he's the Son of God. Secondly, his assessment of who he is is not based on his own opinion alone, but on the opinion of himself and the opinion of the Father. And then thirdly, that to agree on a thing is what the law requires to establish validity. So he says, since I and the Father agree on who I am and what I say, then our testimony is true. Again, if a man said such a thing, it would be boasting. But it's not a man that's saying this, it's the divine Son of God. So if he says, yeah, my witness, that's one, and the Father in heaven, that's two. So we, we're according to your law. So according to verse 14, we have to realize that Jesus' answer and justification for what he's just said comes from his divine knowledge and his insight as God and not man. And then that explains when he says, I didn't come to judge, uh, that's why he doesn't judge from a fleshly perspective. I don't judge as a man with limited knowledge, he says, like you people. You know, he judges as God, who has complete knowledge. So he, you know, if he wants to judge, he can. However, since Jesus is divine, he can say the things that he says because they're true and because God confers them. So in verse 19a it says, so they were saying to him, where is your father? You know, he says, I am the father, the father also. So they say, again, another tactic. Do they deal with what he's just said? No, they pick up on, a, not a minor point, but they pick up on one point and they chase that rabbit for a while. And they say, well, you know, where's your father? They respond with misunderstanding and confusion. They think that he's talking about his father, an earthly father, when he's actually talking about the heavenly father. They want to know where the father he is talking about is so that they can verify what Jesus is saying. So you know, they really don't get it. And so in verse 19b, if you wish, Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. So he answers them plainly that in the way they treat him, they demonstrate that they don't really know who he is and they don't know who his father is. Verse 20. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So John makes an editorial comment here. That's like a little bracket, okay? Uh, about the fact that they didn't seize him at this time because God would not permit it. It wasn't his time. Verse 21, Jesus continues the dialogue once again speaking from the divine perspective. In verse 21 he says, I go away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So here he's talking about his death and his resurrection and the fact that they will not be able to understand what has taken place because they don't believe. <laughs> you, know, you ever have a discussion with someone and they want to talk about a sensitive subject and you say, don't go there. You're not talking about a place, right? You're not talking about Hara or Oklahoma City. You're saying, don't go there, don't, don't discuss that subject, that topic. Well, that's what Jesus is saying to them here. You can't go there. He's not talking about a place. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about his death and burial and resurrection. He said, you can't go there. You can't go to that subject because you don't believe. You, you don't have the wherewithal to, quote, go there. Seeking him and trying to go where he is going refers to the fact that they try with human understanding to grasp the idea of the gospel and they'll fail. And they'll fail because they don't believe and they'll die in their sins because they didn't believe in him. You can't understand it until you believe him. It doesn't make any sense. Of course, Jesus is condemning them for their lack of faith, but they don't understand even the condemnation. They don't even get the condemnation that he puts on them. And so in verse 22, so the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself. There's the proof right there that they don't, they don't get it. Will he? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. Here the Jews demonstrate that they really don't understand what he's talking about. They think that his reference to death means he's going to cause his own death. 
Verse 23 and 24. And he was saying to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. So now he's giving them the direct, the key. He's giving them the key to unlock this mystery. If you want to go there, you have to begin by believing in me, he says. They're from this world. He's from another world. He summarizes the idea by telling them more plainly that they'll die in their sins. Why? Because they, because they sinned, they did bad things, they broke the law. That's not what he's talking about. He says, you're going to die in those sins because you don't believe in me. Because I'm the only way that you can get rid of the condemnation because of those sins. So we know from our perspective that the reason that they die in their sins is because only through faith can they have their sins forgiven. But they don't get it. They don't understand that principle. And because they don't understand that principle and don't believe in Him, He says, well, all the sins that you do, they're going to condemn you in the end because you have no way of having them forgiven. Verse 25a, so they were saying to Him, <laughs> Finally, the light is beginning to penetrate. They say, who are you? Have you ever said that to someone? You know, they're talking and usually it's to your teenager. You know? <laughs> You're going, who are you? Are you a member of this family? You know? So this is kind of, this is kind of the same thing. You know, they're saying, <laughs> they don't know what to say anymore. They're saying, who are you? you know, we don't get what you're talking about. So uh, we can tell by this verse, they're starting to open their eyes, finally. Finally, a decent question. Who are you? And by asking this, they demonstrate that they're beginning to sense that he's someone kind of special. He's not just the ordinary person they think he is. So they ask the question, who are you? As a way of getting him to be more clear as to the declaration of his, of his person. Tell us who you are. You know, they're needing a framework here. Are you a prophet? Are you the Messiah? Are you, what are you? Verse 25, 26, Jesus said to him, this is his answer now, to who are you? They say, what I've been saying to you from the beginning, I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard of him, these I speak to the, um, to the world. And so Jesus tells them that He has been trying to explain this idea about who He is from the very beginning. In verse 26, He reestablishes the idea that everything He is saying to them, whether it be something that He teaches them or something that He brings judgment on them for, comes from God, the God who is true. He also says that the things He speaks are only those things that He's been given to say by God. Of course, this is a sweeping statement that establishes the idea that everything that Jesus is saying comes directly from God. So they say, who are you? And he answers, I'm the guy that speaks for God. I mean, if we want to you know, bring it down to the simple. Who are you? I'm the one who speaks from God. There's nothing that I say that isn't from God. I don't say any more than he says. I don't say any less. If you want to know who I am, I'm God's spokesman. Now, He's more than that, isn't he? But they need baby steps. You know, they, need, they need baby steps. Yet another time where Jesus is declaring His divinity. They say, who are you? He says, I'm the one sent from God. All right, verse 27. They did not realize that He had been speaking to them about the Father. Again, this is another editorial comment from John. He's telling us, the readers, they didn't get it. So, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that everyone believed what he said, but now they are at least understanding the point to his saying. Now they're saying to themselves, oh, oh, okay, oh, you're saying you're from God. Okay, now they have something to hang their, you know, to hang their ideas on, to have some sort of debate. So now Jesus goes forward. You see, they ask him something, he gives them something to chew on, and then he adds another big idea for them to knock, you know, to knock him over again. So in 28 it says, uh, Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing, um, that are pleasing to Him. 
So again, Jesus looks forward to His crucifixion and resurrection and says that this will provide proof. You know, I told you I'm from God. Well, you're going to see that I'm from God when you see you know, the death and the burial and resurrection. You're going to see that I'm from God. I'll give you the proof. And in verse 29, he simply repeats the idea that God is the one who sent him. God is the one who is with him. God will not leave him alone now or in the future. And that all things he does are pleasing to God. In other words, he's saying to them, I'm perfect. I mean, could any one of us here stand up and say, everything I do is pleasing to God? Anybody? Any takers on that one? No. Could anyone say, the only things that I speak are things that come from God. Really? Anybody? Any takers on that? Not even the preacher, I guarantee you. So he's saying to them, you ask me who I am? I told you I'm sent from God? I'll, I'll give you a little more. I'm perfect. You know, let, think about that for a time. Verse 30, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Again, John, the editorial statement. The combination of his challenging words, his declaration of his divinity, the prophecy concerning the future, everything works together to produce faith in the hearts of some of his hearers. And so we see from this cycle uh, repeating itself where Jesus declares his divinity in some manner and then, remember I told you, that's the cycle, right? In one way or another, Jesus declares his divinity or proves his divinity through miracles, you know, one scene after another. That's what John describes. This time it's a dialogue. He describes all the statements that Jesus is saying. I'm perfect, I'm sent from God, everything. You know, he's telling them, I'm God. And John, in an editorial statement, says some of them believed that. Some of them believed it and some of them didn't. Now that means some of the Pharisees believed. You know, the Pharisees are always the bad guys, but not all of them are the bad guys. Some of the Pharisees believed him. All right, so um, now we uh, turn a page. He, he was talking with the Pharisees. Now he's going to talk to somebody else now. Well, probably some who are among the Pharisees. Uh, and this is his new disciples. So we've seen Jesus tangled with the Pharisees over the adultery issue with the woman. We've seen him continue the dialogue with the Jews and the Pharisees as they discuss his identity. We even see the division of those who accept his word and believe and those who reject him. Now we're going to see that he continues to challenge those who say they believe in him with further claims. You believe you're on my side, you're going to be a disciple? Okay, here, I have more for you. And so we begin in verse 31 and 32. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, see the progress? Talking to the crowd, talking to the leaders, debating with the Pharisees. He's thinned the crowd down to those who say, okay, we believe, we want, we want to follow you, we're your followers. Now he's going to have a debate, or excuse me, not a debate, he's going to have a dialogue now with the followers. So he says to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you will set you free. Now in this verse, apparently someone has made a profession of belief and Jesus in a response said, if you are my disciples, got to read between the lines. Someone says, okay, man, I'm glad those guys are gone. I'm glad those disbelievers have gone. It's just us believers now. It's just us disciples and you, Lord. And so now Jesus said, well, if you're really my disciples, if you're truly, if you really want to be my disciples, then this will be proven because you will obey and continue to obey and believe what I say. So the point that he makes here is that if they continue believing and accepting his words, then ultimately they'll know the truth and the truth will free them from what? Well, their ignorance to begin with and eventually will free them from their sins. I know a lot of political people use this verse you know, to talk about democratic freedom in other countries, you know, but that's not what he's talking about. You can still be in jail and be ignorant and lost. You can be in jail for a good cause, you know, free the slaves or whatever, but still as an individual be ignorant of the gospel and consequently be lost. And then find the gospel and know the gospel and then know the truth and then be saved but still be in jail. How, you know, why do we have jail ministries? How many, how many people have been converted in prison? And, and they're converted, they're baptized, hallelujah, they have the Lord 
that they're looking forward to eternal life, or not looking forward to it, but begin experiencing eternal life, and so on and so forth, but the, the governor doesn't commute their sentence. I remember way, you know, when Mr. Bush was president, number two Bush, and was it here in Oklahoma? I think it was a woman you know, who had turned her life around. She was a murderer, but you know, she had turned her life around, so on and so forth. You know, she was a Christian in jail, so on and so forth, and she was under the death penalty. And they made an appeal for her because she had turned her life around, and she was a Christian, so on and so forth. And the appeal was denied, and she was executed. And I remember at the time, the president had said, I am so glad that this woman is right with God, and that she's made her peace with the Lord. And then he added, but our job is to execute justice. And justice says, you know, this is her punishment. You know, whether you agree with that or not, it's not the issue. The point is you can be saved and still have to meet out your uh, sentence. Okay, uh, verse 33. Uh, they answered him, remember now, he's saying, if you're my disciples, you're going to obey what I say. And you're going to believe what I say. And if you do that, you're going to know the truth and the truth will make you free. So they answered him, these are his now new disciples, we are Abraham's descendants and we've never been enslaved to anybody, anyone. How is that you say you will become free? And so you know, they're offended by what he says concerning their freedom. The claim to be Abraham's offspring, meaning descendants of Abraham, and because of that they've never been enslaved to any person. Well, you know, that's wrong. You know, they've been enslaved throughout history by various nations. But these Jews like to think that their relationship to Abraham was the thing that made them right before God and they had religious freedom guaranteed because of this heritage. They reject Jesus' offer of freedom by saying in essence, we've always been free because we're Abraham's seed. We don't need you to free us spiritually. We've always been free. So we go to verse 34. Jesus answered them. See the dialogue? Back and forth all the time. Different groups. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word is no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. So he starts by explaining to them that their slavery is to sin, not to men that because of that they will not remain in the house or in the presence of God forever. They're thinking we will remain God's people because of our cultural heritage. And he's saying, uh-uh, you remain in the house because the Son has set you free from sin. So his offer of freedom is to free them from that sin and give them a portion of what he has. He acknowledges that they are culturally related to Abraham, yes, but even this relationship doesn't protect them from the slavery they have to sin. And he repeats the fact that he speaks only the things that he, you know, he keeps repeating, hey, remember, you believe because I said I only speak the things of the Father. Well, I'm, I'm still speaking the things of the Father even though you don't like what I'm saying. Verse 39a, it says, they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Now we're getting to it rubber meets the road now. Now the crowd senses that he's accusing them of and they, they come back with the idea that Abraham is their father. In other words, they're saying, we have no other father but Abraham. I don't know who your father is. They say to him, I don't know who he is, but we know who our, because he tells them, you don't know where you're from. They say, yes, we do. We're from Abraham. We're sticking with that. And so verse 39, B, Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. But as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. This Abraham did not do. You are doing the deeds of your father. So Jesus responds to their declaration by saying that if they were Abraham's children, they wouldn't be doing what they intend to do, which is to kill him. Remember, what's he doing? Well, he's reading their hearts. <laughs> he's telling them what they're thinking. Not only is he accusing them of an evil thing, in doing so he demonstrates that he is reading their minds. And he finishes up the section by saying once again that because of the thing that they are trying to do, they prove that Abraham is not their father because Abraham would never think of doing such a thing. And that is trying to kill someone who's bringing them the word of God, 41b. They said to him, we were not born of fornication, we have one father, God. Man, that is a real diss right here. 
This is a real insult. You know, now the crowd really steps. He says, you know, you're from below, you, know, you, don't, you don't get it. Now the crowd steps up, if you wish, and declare not only are they children of Abraham, but God is their father. The point that they're making is that, if they, uh, that they are children of God. The unspoken insult here is that they charge him of being born of fornication. Yeah, he said, you know, we know who our father is, you know, Abraham, but you don't know who your father is because that lingering hometown prejudice you know, about Mary being pregnant before the wedding, you know what I'm saying, that lingering prejudice remains and so they hurl that at him. And these are small villages and small towns, you know, people talk and so they insult him with this. 42 to 47, we're around in the corner, he said, Jesus said to them, if God were your father you would love me, not insult me, that's you know, between the lines. For I proceeded forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but He sent me. Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you don't believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them, because you are not of God. So he picks up on what they say about their father being God, and he turns it back on them by saying that if you were from God, you'd love me. Why? Because you know who I am. And he goes on to explain why they cannot understand what he is saying, and that is because they're really not from God, they're from the devil. In other words, it's not that the devil gave them life, but they are, their impulse is acting from the devil's persuasion and not from God. It's not God that's prompting them to say these things, it's the devil prompting them to say these things. And so Jesus explains the simple truth that if they were from God they would understand, they would accept and love the things that He is saying. However, because they reject Him and they intend to kill Him for what He is saying, they prove that the source of their lives is not God but the devil himself. So in the last verse or two, he summarizes his argument by simply saying that they don't believe what he says simply because they're not from God. Verse 48, the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Now it's getting hot. <laughs> you know, they insult him because you know, they accuse him of being a child of fornication. You know, now, now it's like you're demon possessed, you're a Samaritan. I mean, <laughs> It's like saying you're from West Virginia or something. You know? All those watching from West Virginia, I apologize. So the Jews are obviously angry and make two accusations. A, he's a Samaritan. In other words, he doesn't belong to the nation of Israel. That's really the insult. You don't belong among us. And also, you have a demon, meaning you are possessed of the forces of Satan. Now they're just angry. You ever notice when you're having a debate with someone and you're just showing them the facts and so on and so forth, they got nothing to argue with, what do they do? They get angry. And what happens when they get angry? They just insult you and accuse you of all kinds of things. That's what's happening here. Uh, verse 49 to 51, Jesus, he keeps talking back to them. I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. So he tells them, I know how you're insulting me. I get it. I understand what you're, what you're doing. But I do not seek my glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, wow, he will never see death. I mean, he's saying a lot there. Never see death. He tells them that their accusations and insults dishonor him, the one sent from God. But he also says that their dishonor doesn't discourage him because he's not looking for his own honor. Rather, he wants honor to go to God where it belongs. And he finishes by saying, if anybody keeps his word, they'll have eternal life. Once again, he finishes this debate, how? A challenge to believe in him. Not, hey, you hurt my feelings, that's not nice, you know? I mean, really, you know who I am? I'm the son of God, I could, I could really mess you up. You know? No, he keeps putting the offer back 
You know, they attack, he keeps coming back with the offer of eternal life. He keeps coming back with the encouragement to believe. 52, 53, the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Surely you're not greater than our father Abraham, who died. The prophets died too. Whom do you make yourself out to be? So they pounce on his answer and they use to support their accusation that he is the devil. They said that if both Abraham and the prophets are dead, how can you claim to offer eternal life? In other words, if you're so smart, how come those guys are dead? That's, what, that's, that's the argument. So they turn around and challenge him by saying, are you greater than Abraham? In the end, they're basically, in, in the end, the first question they asked was, who are you? Okay, now they're saying, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? 54 to 56, Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It's my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say, He is our God. And it, you have not come to know Him, but I know Him. And if you say that I do not know Him, I will be a liar like you. But I do know Him and keep His word. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. So Jesus picks up on their last question. He answers them that if he is trying to glorify himself, his glory doesn't mean anything. But if his glory comes from God, the glory is the things that he's saying, the things that he's doing. He says, if that's just me, then if I talk about myself, you know, that, that's not accurate. But if all the things that are happening through me come from God, you have to pay attention. So he's saying this in such a way to suggest that he himself was there when Abraham understood the promise of the Messiah and this made him glad. Boy, this, this challenges the crowd. This really gets him upset. So the Jews said to them, you're not yet 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. Once again, they only accept the human side. They're saying, how can this man say that he's, you know, he's greater than Abraham? How can this man know what Abraham was thinking? They simply see the physical age and they don't, they don't get it. Of course, this would be true if Jesus was only a man. It would be ridiculous. So in verse 58, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And so in his answer to the Jews about Abraham, Jesus not only says that he saw Abraham, but the way he expresses it is remarkable. I know it's been a long lesson here, but this is the key, this is the, you know, this is the key right here. In saying, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, Jesus is referring back to the time when Moses was speaking to God and asking God, who should, who should Moses say sent him to the Pharaoh? When the people ask, you know, where do you come from? Who sent you? And what shall I say to them? You know? And God answered Moses, to tell the people, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am uh, has sent me to you. Uh, the Jews were very familiar with this passage, I forgot to put it up there, um, and recognized how Jesus had referred to himself in the same way that Almighty God had referred. I mean, how clear can he make it? Now he's, he's not saying, look at the evidence and let the evidence lead you to understand who I am. Now he's just, you know, psh, he just puts it right out there, I am. In other words, I'm God, basically. But uh, uh, the Jews not believing this, what do they see? Well, they see blasphemy. You know, either you fall down on your face and begin worship, worshiping, or you tear your clothes and see someone who's doing something terrible. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself um, and went out of the uh, temple. So we see the, um, the, um, you know, we see the, uh, the course of the uh, dialogue between uh, Jesus and the crowd and the woman, Jesus and the Pharisees, then Jesus and the so-called believers, and now even the so-called believers have been challenged. So a couple of lessons I want to give and then we'll, I know we're a little late, just let me do this please. Uh, we see the cycle of belief and disbelief continues as Jesus dialogues with the different groups. Couple of lessons. One, Jesus came for forgiveness, not judgment. That doesn't mean there's not going to be a judgment, but His purpose in coming was to um, orchestrate, if you wish, forgiveness, to make forgiveness possible for all people. 
And that's a, a thing that people misunderstand when they say, well, the Bible, you know, you know, people who are very liberal about moral issues, the Bible says we ought to love, and Jesus said we shouldn't judge, and blah, blah, blah. They're, they're, they're not seeing the big picture. Of course, he said, we ought to love our enemies and not judge one another. He, and he said, I didn't come to judge. People love to say that. Jesus himself said, I didn't. Well, no, his mission was forgiveness. There will be a judgment, but that'll come later. Second, obedience is the sifter. And this comes to us in our age. Jesus is always sifting his followers. Even the ones who said, hey, we're believers, we'll follow you. He went ahead and sifted them. And the way that he sifts believers is through the principle of obedience. He puts things in front of you all the time to see if you will obey or disobey. That's how he separates you know, the men from the boys type thing. And then the third lesson, Jesus always tests his disciples. Sometimes you get tired you know, of the challenges of life and so on and so forth. Realize that God is always putting the test in front of you in order to grow your faith, in order to grow yourself, uh, to grow um, in yourself as a spiritual being. Don't be angry because there are tests in life. Don't be angry at God for that. Those things are a tool that He uses to develop and grow our faith. Okay, very long, uh, very long chapter. I'm glad you stayed uh, with me on that one. Uh, we'll pick up chapter nine next time we, uh, we have our class. Thank you very much for your attention.